Sure. Can can you hear me online? Yes. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Sure. So you haven't missed much online. It's just setting up the presentation. So um, I will we'll, on this slide. We'll talk about electricity uh, prices across the quarter. So. Just um, yeah. This might be a bit thick. Sure. It should work now. Right. Get that going. Okay. Can you still hear me online? So. Okay. Um, now I've got two there here. Okay. Yeah. I'll just stand still. It's all right. Okay. One off. Yeah. No worries. It's an N minus two, so do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're um, good redundancy here on the microphones. <laughs> All right, so uh, to get back to it, electricity prices. So we can see here the chart on the left shows the, in the purple stack, shows the quarterly average prices for the last uh, few years, going back to 2020. Um, and you can see uh, last Q2, Q222 is the big outlier here at um, $264 megawatt hour, and even Q3 last year as well, which was, was quite high. We had quite high prices in July last year. So that's the so-called energy crisis, where um, particularly at the end of June, we saw sustained high levels of prices um, with the market suspension. So since then, prices have really come off quite a lot. Um, and then this quarter here, represented by the three monthly bars in teal, uh, so it's three monthly average prices, but the dotted line there just shows the average quarterly price, which was $108 megawatt hour, which is around 60% less than uh, than last Q2. So coming off quite significantly, although it's it's a 31% increase from, from Q1 this year. So as far as two Q, Q2s go, it's a significant decrease from last year, but it's still the second highest Q2 on record. Um, cool. So the chart on the right just breaks this the uh, breaks it down by region. So we've got the five NEM regions there, or NEM states, and then we've got three columns per state, the three columns representing uh, Q222, so the same time last year in, in red column, Q123, the, the immediately prior column in the middle, just for reference, and Q223, the quarter we're talking about today in, in the dark purple there. And then the shaded, uh, so the top of the stack is the average prices. So you can see average prices have come down significantly as, as across all, in all regions. But importantly, the shaded region, which is the contribution to ab the average price from prices, from spot prices that were above $300 megawatt hour, which we commonly call the, the cap return. Um, that was quite significant last year and it's come down significantly this year. So last year we called the about the cap return, the shed area, and the and the area underneath it, the average energy. So we don't really expect prices to go above three hundred dollars a megawatt hour unless there's a, a, a short term supply demand incident or interconnector outage or something like that. Whereas last year we saw significant amounts of cap prices. So this quarter, fortunately, we didn't see see as much. We saw a bit in Queensland, New South Wales, and South Australia. Um, we've seen the similar sort of that dynamics across the NEM as a recent quarters with the northern regions of Queensland, New South Wales, having a bit of a price separation between the southern regions, with the exception here of South Australia. So South Australia's average price came close to New South Wales, Queensland, but really only because uh, of this cap component here, the cap return, the shaded region there, which was due to a, uh, uh, that, so that was a price separation. So it's the price separated from Victoria on a number of days following an outage on the Haywood interconnector, which restricted exports from Victoria to South Australia. So to, just to give you an idea that that cap component there is from about 8% of the time prices were above $300 a megawatt hour, but in Victoria, there was less than 2%. So it's hardly even visible here. Okay, so moving on from the prices and well, from the what the prices were to explain, oops, gone, I've gone backwards for some reason. Uh, so to, to drill into some of the drivers for those price changes, what I've shown here is the chart on the left, 
is uh, shows two quarters, Q222 on the top and Q223 on the bottom. And the horizontal bar chart shows the percentage of times different fuel types in the, in the NEM or specifically the mainland NEM region, so excluding Tasmania, uh, how often those fuel types were the marginal price setter. So they're the ones that set the price. So you can see in Q222, uh, it was 24% of the time black coal set the price and compare that to Q223 this year was about 28% of the time. And the numbers within each bar are the average price when that fuel was the average, uh, oh, sorry, the marginal uh, fuel, marginal price setter. So, so what we can see is last year, we had those very high prices. When black coal was setting the price, it was setting the price at around $250 a megawatt hour. Brown coal, around $60 a megawatt hour. Uh, gas, importantly, around 15% of the time at $320 a megawatt hour. Hydro quite a lot high at 310 and small amounts from, from wind and grid scale solar and batteries. This year, that black hole, those, the black hole fleet set the prices more often at a significantly less price, $98 megawatt hour. So, same with uh, brown coal. So, and just keeping with the theme about coal generators, the chart on the right shows the average black hole offer volumes for the last two Q2s, so the Q222 in purple and Q223 in teal. So the curve has moved to the right. So what that means is uh, this year, there are more offers available at the same price than last year. So if we take say a hundred dollar price band, so if we take it for a hundred dollars, last year there was around 9,200 megawatts available for that price or less than that. And this year for the same price, hundred dollars a megawatt hour, there was 10,200 something megawatts available for that same price. So significantly lower prices offered into the market from, from black hole generators. That's caused by a number of uh, factors. Last year, we had uh, issues with coal availability itself in the mines. There was uh, the new caused wet coal, caused train outages, train line outages. So supply getting coal to power stations. We also had very high um, international coal prices. So the Newport export, Newcastle export thermal coal price was around $514 a tonne, just caused by global demand for, for energy. And this year that, that export price has come down to $240 a tonne. And then also impacting this is the uh, government interventions on uh, the prices that coal-fired generators will pay for, for coal, capping that at $120 a tonne. Uh, oh, sorry, one more thing on this chart before, before I move on. So this, so this is um, purposely plotted between zero and $300 megawatt hour because that's the marginal fuel range, the marginal price range. But uh, for those that are familiar, the prices, you can offer prices in down to minus $1,000 megawatt hour. And what we can't really see here because it's not on the chart, but you can see it a little bit here is the prices in those lower volumes in those lower brands have actually increased, sorry, decreased because... Um, because of AGL's retirement of Liddell units. So the Liddell units retired in late April and they often bid in uh, uh, significant volumes at minus $1,000 and that's been removed. But you can see that that removal of Liddell has been more than offset by increases in availability elsewhere in the, in the black coal fleet. Um, yep, so we'll move on. This is the last slide on, on prices before we move on to talking about demand and generation. So in this slide, we'll just discuss negative prices. So the chart on the left shows the frequency or occurrence of negative prices for the last five Q2s in the four mainland NEM regions, which is where we see most of the negative prices. So across overall, it was around 9% of intervals were marked by negative prices, zero negative prices, which was a five percentage point increase from the same time last year and a record high Q2. Um, so I'll delve into the reasons for that as we go along, but some of the reasons there is just that lower daytime demand and higher uh, VRE from both wind and grid scale solar, which often bid into the market at negative prices. Um, so across the, the mainland then we can see South Australia had the highest incidence of negative prices around 17% of the time. Um, and in Victoria is quite high as well, 13%. But what we also saw was this large increase in Queensland going from around 2% of the time to to 
So that's shown in a little bit more detail on the chart on the right, which shows the frequency of or the occurrence of negative prices by time of day. And we can see in Queensland it, for both Q2-22 and Q2-23, the incidences are all during the middle of the day, but particularly more so this, this quarter, this Q2. And that's really just driven by this just decrease in operational demand in the middle of the day, which I'll talk about on the next slide, and increase in grid scale solar, particularly in Queensland itself. Um, and then just finally on this slide, uh, not really shown here is the value of negative prices. So if you take the average price when it is negative, that number has decreased, as in it's gone to a, a lower negative number, a lo lower down number in the 60 to 40, minus 60 to minus $40 megawatt hour range. And that's, um, that correlates with an increase in large scale renewable certificates, which have increased in value from or high $40 a certificate to $53 a certificate um, between the two, two, two quarters. So all of that really just contributed to, to uh, uh, downward pressure on, on wholesale prices across the quarter. Okay, I'll move on now to, to talk about demand and generation. Um, not sure if, yeah, if we want to Stop for any questions now, or should I keep going? Yeah, stop for these minutes. Sure. Um, sure, go ahead, sir. Do you guys find the peaks of price? I have a very loud voice. It's okay. Um, <laughs> do you guys try and predict those negative price occurrences into the future and correlate that against like renewable energy uptake, all that kind of stuff? And what would those predictions be? Um, in terms of forecasting prices, it's not something that AMO does. Um, we do look at uh, how many, uh, we do do demand forecast, sorry, uh, you know, or demand forecasting. Uh, that'll have more to do with this, on this slide in terms of the, the shallowing out of the middle of the day, which is likely to incur more negative prices. Um, but no, no, AMO doesn't forecast the occurrence of negative prices. On the negative prices as well, um, do you, so like you mentioned the 40 to six, negative 40 to $60. So I assume that's an average. And so the bulk of that negative pricing is sort of rational because it's LGC, Correct. negative LGC. Do you also see an increase or do you know if there's an increase in the kind of congestion style, negative thousand style bidding to just get dispatched? Because um, obviously that's the kind of non- you're just trying to you're disorderly bidding style, yeah. just trying to get dispatch. Is that also going up or is that roughly the same um, and, and a small proportion of intervals? Um, we haven't looked at those negative, negative price, negative thousand price bids so much, uh, but we do look at curtailment across the VRE fleet, which I'll touch on a little bit in a later slide. We don't touch it on as much in this, this quarter as Q4, Q1, where we see a large amount of uh, curtailment just due to that local congestion, I suppose. Um, but yes, it's still 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 a common occurrence with Katalman and off wind and grid scale solar. Um, sure. Um, what did that solar look like, say last year? Okay. Is it really changing? Well, let me let me let me explain the slide, and I think right. it, I think it'll answer your question. But yeah, um, so but thank you thank you for for, for asking that. Um, so I'll just discuss the in the slide. We'll just talk about the demand changes across the NEM. So the chart on the left shows the history of Q two uh, under operational demand. So that's the purple line going back to two thousand five, which is when Tasmania joined the NEM. So for those unfamiliar, operational demand is the it's a very important key term in for AMO because that's the amount of grid generation that needs to be supplied to meet to meet demand. So historically, that that there's just one definition of that, and then circa 2016, uh, we when we really started noticing the uptake of rooftop solar, or as we call it, distributed PV, um, we could see the way that distributed PV works is it effectively offsets the demand locally first both at the household and in the neighborhood level. So the amount of energy required by the grid is, is less, less by the amount of rooftop solar. 
So that teal line there is underlying demand. So that's the sort of native uh, inherent demand across all consumers across the NEM. And the difference between underlying demand and operational demand is distributed PV or rooftop solar. So we can see underlying demand has increased Q2 on Q2, it's around 200 megawatts or so increase. Uh, some of that to do is, is to do with weather. We had a colder May than last year, but then that was offset by a warmer June. So a bit of a mixed result there. But we really can't explain the decrease in un operational demand. So from this number down to here, uh, which is a uh, 200, around 200 megawatt decrease as well. We really can't explain that by this increase in distributed PV. Um, so just to say this is this Q operational demand here, this Q2 is the second lowest since, since Tasmania joined. So very low operational demand on average across the quarter. So to explain the Q2 22 to Q2 23 uh, changes a little bit more, I'll show the chart on the right, which is a change by time of day and just between Q2 22 and Q2 23. So that gray shaded area there is the increases by, by half hour in underlying demand. So it correlates to the increase in the teal. And we can see it's increased mostly throughout the day, not so much in the evening. But really that just means um, that's just, that can be mostly explained by temperature changes. Uh, but the big change is that increase in rooftop uh, or distributed PV. So it's a negative here because it's coming, it's reducing demand. So it has reduced. Uh, so if you offset the underlying demand with the distributed PV, you get the red dotted line, which is operational demand. So operational demand has decreased a little bit in the morning and the evening, but during the middle of the day, it's really decreased. So again, just to emphasize this, it's mostly decreased because uh, there's been less energy required from the grid and more energy being met by rooftop solar. So that change, this is a change, this shaded yellow here, it's a change. Um, uh, it's the highest, so it's changed around uh, on average about 431 megawatts, but that's a year on year change of 30%, which is slightly lower than the last, uh, than, than it's the second highest year on year growth. But we're definitely, if there's another chart in the report, which I don't have here, which just shows that um, rooftop PV or distributed PV is just, growing year on year, every quarter we see it increasing. Um, even, even this quarter has the largest output of uh, 1900 megawatts, which is, um, which is, sorry, the highest Q2 output. Um, so also just on this slide before I, before I move on, in terms of operational demand, we saw a couple of records. So we saw the minimum instantaneous operational demand so at a point in time in New South Wales around 4,100 megawatts. So that's an all-time low record for New South Wales. And that occurred on Easter Sunday at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon when distributed PV, so the sun is out, uh, distributed PV is accounting for about 43% of uh, underlying demand. And then similarly, we saw record minimums just for Q2, not all time in South Australia and Victoria, uh, similarly on, on a weekend or public holiday in, during the middle of the day. That's, that's when we're seeing minimum demand really, really get down quite low. Um, just before I move on, did, did I answer your question about the, yes. oh, great, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so that's demand changes. So if we flip now to look at the, the changes that made up that uh, on the generation side, the changes that, that, that were, happened across from Q2 22 to Q2 23, what I've got here is the chart on the left showing the increases by fuel type uh, and then the decreases by fuel type, resulting in a net increase in generation by fuel type of around 143. So it's effectively the increase in underlying demand. But I'll go through them, I'll go through the fuel sources one by one on this slide. And then in the following slides, I'll discuss some of the fuels in more detail. So the chart on the right, um, we'll just take it step by step. So first we'll talk about this increase of 431 megawatts from uh, rooftop PV or distributed PV, which I realize very hard to see here in the room, but it's <laughs> effectively the same, same as on the previous slide, but just now on the positive axis because I'm showing increases in, in generation by fuel type. So unsurprising that happens during the middle of the day, might make it a bit easier to see. On top of that is the next uh, increase by fuel type, which is around 350 megawatts from 
grid scale solar. I'll go into a bit more details as to where that's coming from in the next few slides. Um, but yeah, it's quite, quite a large increase there. Next one is around 400 megawatts increased from wind. Um, and you can see that happens across all hours of the day, maybe a little bit less during the middle of the day, but, but it's definitely an increase um, everywhere. Next one is brown coal. You can see a slight increase in the morning, slight decrease, sorry, increase in the, in the morning and evening, and a slight decrease in the middle of the day, netting out to a, an increase of 76 megawatts. And the next one's quite interesting. So this next one is black coal. So we can see the black coal fleet, both in New South Wales and Queensland, has decreased by 95 megawatts quarter on quarter or year on year. And we can see that it's increased during the morning and evening, which is around two thirds of the time, but massively decreased during the middle of the day, effectively when the sun is up. And I've got a few slides on that coming up around the, the amount black coal generators are flexing. And then just to finish it off, the biggest decrease by fuel type was gas fire generation at 740 megawatts. And you can see that's decreased across, across the day. Go into that in details in a few slides time. And finally, a decrease of 270 megawatts in hydroelectricity, which you can see is most of that decrease predominantly happens during the middle of the day. Again, where operational demand is decreased because of this um, uh, distributed PV and grid scale solar and wind has effectively taken its place at a lower, lower uh, offer. Okay, so I'll spend the next couple of slides talking about the black hole fleet because it was quite significant to um, to to just to understand how the prices have changed from Q2 22 to Q2 23. The chart on the left just shows the average black coal fire generation output for uh, across the NEM uh, going back to 2001 for, for, for just for Q2s. So we can see this is the second lowest Q2 on record, lower, even lower than last year, which last year was, was the record then and, and, and was beset by uh, coal outages and um, availability, which, we, uh, which I discussed earlier. Oops. Liddell? Uh, late April this year. And I'll show that a bit, bit more about Liddell on the next slide. I know you're thinking ahead, that's great. Um, well, it's actually, you can see a little bit here. So, so in terms of outages, so New South, so the chart on the right shows outages for the New South Wales and Queensland black hole fleets between Q2 22 and Q2 23. So you can see there's significantly less outages in, in, New South Wales, around 1300 megawatts or so less outages, dominantly from, from Bayswater and Mount Piper, and then also Liddell, as in Liddell had some outages last year. Um, on the Queensland side, we saw a decrease, sorry, I didn't explain, in New South Wales, across the fleet, we saw an increase of 80 megawatts on average, and that's because of reduced outages. Whereas in Queensland, we saw a decrease of 175, 174 megawatts um, which you can see here is driven partly by an increase in outages and a decrease in availability. In particular, Tarong North having a stand out, standard outage from 1st of April through to mid-June and the Carlite C3 unit, which went out in October, continue, continuing its outage. Then I'll just spend one more slide on black coal, uh, going into a bit more detail here and hopefully answer the question around Liddell. So the chart on the left shows the five uh, New South Wales black hole generators, at least the, the five that they were at the start of the quarter. So um, you can see some, see some quite quite varied changes across the different uh, across the fleet there. So as I said, on average, it was an increase of around eighty megawatts. Uh, so that includes the outage of Liddell. So we're just taking a step, so starting from Bayswater on the left, we can see that in Q two twenty two, Bayswater was outputting around 1500 megawatts. So the stacks here are the purple, so the top of the stack is the availability. So that's how much that generator could have done if it was just running, you know, if it was dispatched in, in every five minute period that it was available. Uh, so, you, And then the purple is what it actually did do. So the ratio between them two, the two is shown there as the percentage and that's called the utilization factor. 
we can see Bayswater last year was 97% utilization. So it's pretty much running as, as much as it can. Um, and as I mentioned last year, it had a significant amount of outages. So this year in Q2 23, so a very large increase in, in availability caused by this lower, lower time on outage um, and an increase in generation, but a much lower utilization rate of 80%. So probably jump ahead and you can see the chart on the right uh, where this is going. Uh, the reason why its utilization rate went down so low is because it's not generating close to its availability during the middle of the day. So it's flexing up and down throughout the day, but I'll touch on that a little, in a little bit. Um, the other big changes we saw were in Araring, um, increasing its, its output uh, by 176 megawatts. Again, reduced outages, increasing its um, availability, but it also increased its uh, utilization. So it's running more during the evening and overnight. Uh, slight decrease in Bowles Point and Mount Piper and then Liddell. So you can see here Liddell last year, the three units it was running then had, it was running quite hard at 94%. And then this quarter, it only ran in, in April. So at the end of April, they staggered over a few days, so it shut down the last three units. Um, so that decrease in Liddell is more than offset by the increases in Bayswater and Raring. Um, and then, yeah, just the chart on the right showing the average, the not just New South Wales, but the Queensland, the, the whole NEM black coal fleet average by time of day for the last few Q2s. And what you can really see is that that uh, compared to longer before that, when black hole generators would just generate flat across the day, they really are flexing up and down to meet um, demand across the day. And they're really flexing down during the middle of the day. So this year on year decrease in the middle of the day, which I guess that shaded the, the difference between Q222 and Q223 in the middle of the day was shown on the few slides ago with that really big decrease during the middle of the day as operational demand comes down and other fuel sources come into this place displace uh, black hole. Uh, it is varied across the fleet. Some black hole generators flex a lot more than others. Namely here, Bayswater did, did pretty much half of that change of year on year flexing in the middle of the day. Um, my understanding is we've still got a long way to go in terms of how low, how low that minimum can go. But uh, yeah, they're definitely flexing up and down to meet that uh, change, in, change in operational demand as well as the change in prices. Okay, moving away from black coal, but still sticking to thermal um, generation. We put this slide in here to talk about gas fire generation, just because that was the largest change by fuel type. So last year, um, so the chart on the left shows the gas fired output for the, for the last uh, Q2s going back to 2001. And we can see that on average gas output has been trending down. There's a bit of an outlier last year at Q2 22. Um, so this, this year it was 742 megawatts less, that's 34% less, but a large amount of that is explained by how, how significant gas fired out, out, output was last year. And just to, to remind everybody last year, we saw those sustained levels of extremely high spot prices with multiple coal fired uh, power station outages and supply issues limiting their output, meaning there was a high demand on other forms of generation, namely gas and also hydro. So this Q2, we didn't see those extreme spot prices. Um, so we saw, and we saw greater availability from coal-fired generation and more renewables. Uh, so in fact, the chart on the right shows the amount of uh, coal-fired offers um, moving the opposite direction from the coal chart I showed before. So from moving from the purple to the teal, moving to the left, left meaning uh, coal-fired, sorry, gas generator operators were committing less of their plant for dispatch, uh, pretty much at all price bands. Um, and then just, oops, just quickly, it's not shown on the slide, but I'll just touch on hydro. The hydro output also decreased by 272 megawatts. And the main reason for that is uh, last year, we saw those significant amount of above $300 megawatt hour prices. And when that happens, hydro plant owners generally sell uh, cap contracts, so they're, they're paying out the price of above three hundred dollars megawatt hour. So they're heavily incentivized to run when price is above three hundred dollars megawatt hour. Whereas this quarter, as we showed on the first or second slide, uh, there wasn't as much 
above three hundred dollars a megawatt hour prices, so they were they ran they didn't have to run as often. Although um, they still do have to run, they still have to meet their agreed water release levels. So part of the reason for their decrease, different to gas, their decreases were more centered during the middle of the day when when prices were quite low. Sure. Can you remind us the price cap last year? Was that administered in Q2 or Q3? Uh, Q2. The back in Q2, Q2, the back of Q2. Q2. So I know the price, like offers ne wouldn't necessarily have had to change because the cap is applied on the price, on the settled price. But was it really reasonable to assume that gas generators would have adjusted their offers knowing that the price cap had been had been applied? Like and like and do these offers, I mean it's an average, right? Yeah. It would include that. That's, that's I'm just surprised yeah. that it's shifted to the left. I'm a little surprised by that. You would have thought it would have, if anything, would have shifted to the, well, I don't know, maybe yeah. the, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good, curious a good about question. That. Um, yeah. You're right. It, it, I think it doesn't include what's for offers. So you're right. This is unrelated to the cap because it's just offers. But at the same time, but, they probably yeah. would have adjusted their offers in light of the cap or I, something like that. Understood, understood. Yeah. I'm just curious about that, how yeah. much that would have affected it. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I think we, we, we have to explain this by the lack of offers in there just because there's less less high prices so less less they're okay. less incentivized to bring those those plant online making them available sure, sure. okay thank you cool. all right um moving on to the final slide in the generation in the nem section so this slide just shows the changes in vre or, or wind and grid scale solar so the uh chart on the left shows the increases from Q222 to Q223 for different for different regions and by different fuel types for the different colors there. So together across all regions and, and both fuel types, it was an increase of 745 megawatts, or about 20% increase. Um, so again, record record Q2 output of, of those fuel sources. So we can break it down into the two different fuel sources. So we'll talk about the green, the, the wind first. So the wind increased by 400 megawatts or so from last year. And as you can see from this chart, most of that was in Victoria. Um, so we can break down the increases, not shown on the chart, but in the, in the report, we break down the, the increases from existing plant and new plant. So in Victoria, actually of that 400 megawatt increase, sorry, across the NEM, the 400 megawatts, most of which came from Victoria, um, a good portion around third maybe came from uh, existing wind farms, namely uh, MacArthur and Stockyard Hills, very two large uh, wind farms in uh, southwestern Victoria, which just increased their available capacity factor. So higher wind speeds on, on more often. Um, but I won't name them all, but we did see the rest of it really, the rest of the increases is really just from commissioning of new, new or recently installed plant. Um, so lots of wind coming on. Also in South Queensland and South Australia as well, just to point that out. And then on the solar side, um, in, in total is around 350 megawatt increase. So that's a year on year growth of 37%. And clearly most of that's coming from Queensland, but also New South Wales, so those Northern regions. Um, uh, unlike wind, most of that, um, well, we did, well, we did see increased solar irradiance for the existing solar fleet. But most of this growth is coming from new or recently installed uh, 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 grid-scale solar projects. And in Queensland alone, there's there's ten projects that that basically weren't outputting uh, their full capacity. They either weren't around last Q2 or they weren't outputting their full capacity. So a large amount of wind uh, solar coming out of there. Just to touch on curtailment uh, again, Q2 is not really a Big quarter for curtailment. It's more of a Q4, Q1 uh, quarter, but we did we did see a, an increase in curtailment of 20 megawatts this quarter. So curtailment due to system strength or uh, network constraints. Um, so that's that is seasonally down from Q1, about 80 megawatts less than Q1, and about 150 megawatts less than Q4. And most of those curtailments were in in wind in Victoria and South Australia, and specifically wind. And wind within Victoria's western Western Victoria uh, res zone, so sort of well-known area that's that can be quite quite constrained. And then just finally on the slide, the chart on the right shows the, uh, the some of the 
records well the instantaneous share of renewable generation so this is just at a point in time across the quarter what the highest percentage the highest uh, contribution from renewable sources so this quarter that was 66.4 percent on the 3rd of may at, at one o'clock um, so that's not a record it's record q2 it's not an all-time record but it's only slightly less than q4 which is which is unusual in that you know uh, wouldn't expect to see as much sun in Q2 23, and that's really just driven, as I said, by the increase of, of wind and grid scale solar that we've seen. Um, as a fuel source, wind itself, just, just wind by itself, hit an instantaneous uh, record several times during the quarter, um, and has since, since surpassed it in July. And also wind and grid scale solar combined hit, a, hit an all-time record. Uh, okay. And that's it for the, the NEM generation section. So happy to take some questions, yep. Um, we dropped in wind off. Hi, the drop in wind in New South Wales, did, did some turbines burn down? Did someone turn the wind off or, or some other reason? It's a good question. Um, trying to think off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think I think it was just lower, lower capacity factors. So yeah, lo lower wind speeds, yep. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I was wondering, um, you show in one of the previous slides that uh, coal is trying to compensate during the nights and off peak, probably with some production, what is, uh, is lacking during the day. Do you see a change uh, in, the, in, the, in the bidding also? So try to recover the cost uh, off peak eventually. Yeah. Um, do you mean this chart? On the, the right here, um, yeah, maybe the, the previous one. Uh, yeah, one? this one. You see that there's more more coal production during off peak eventually. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so what I probably didn't explain this chart is that if you take the net of all of this across, the, you you get back to that change in underlying demand, which was you know more or less pretty flat across the day. Like if you're adding the positives there and the negatives, they more or less net each other out. So really this increase in black coal here in the, mo the morning and evening peak is really just uh, making up for that decrease of gas last year. So last year we saw just so much gas because there wasn't coal fired available. We just saw more, more black coal coming online there. So and, and do, do you see like they're trying to beat like higher prices like during the evening than, than they would have or, or night that they would have done in the past? Yeah, I, I, we haven't looked at the bids across the time of day because yeah. generally they're you know, it's a coal fire station. It doesn't really bother them what time mm -hmm. of day um, they generate into. And they, all I can really do is just go back to this, whoops, this this off a slide here, which off a curve here, and see that, yeah, across across price bands above, you know, above in the evening, these the prices will all be above fifty dollars a megawatt hour. So there is a lot more offers there at lower prices. So presumably, yeah, they, they're being dispatched more often because they're bidding in at lower prices. Yeah. Oh, well. Wow. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, I think you may have answered earlier, but the the increased drop in gas generation compared to coal, um, which is obviously seems to me a bad thing, you know, for decarbonisation, we want the coal to be dropping more than gas. Is that what you explained earlier with the prices? Is that simply a price reflection that that gas is a higher, you know, LCOE, or is it to do with what you mentioned that the year before there was actually an abundance of gas generation, so the the drop this year is actually more returning to a normal baseline? Yeah. I, I'd say it's the, the latter in terms of last last year having. Um, I'll go to this slide. Oops. This slide here, you can see that Q2, 22, essentially being an outlier in terms of it having much more generation in Q2, 22, uh, because you know there's really no other source of uh, generation source that could come online to meet the lack of coal generation availability. Um, so, gas came on gas prices were already high so they can come on and still be profitable but then that in turn keeps prices high that, that change from last year to this year might, so that change from last year to this year might not be reflective of, of the broader trend in, in the net okay right correct yeah that's, that's, that's sort of what it's trying to point out here and that in general and as you can see in this chart here there's less gas offered you know uh because lower prices um yeah, it's a um, it's a bit of an unusual one that last year there was just so much gas output. Can I make a comment on that? Sure. Um, 
the gas is too expensive. So gas has fallen 55% and coal has fallen 17% over the last five years. Yeah. And that'll continue. Yeah. Particularly with storage in the grid, <coughs> gas will fall down, continue faster than coal. Yeah, well, I've got a few slides on, on the gas markets after this, so we can, we can cover that. Uh, th thanks, Sean. Th th just another observation last year. You had some uh, coal uh, constraints, supply constraints, and high coal prices. So gas was substituting coal. So it's probably a once-off. But if you had a repeat macro uh, situation with coal, um, all those factors will come back into play. So it's quite dynamic. I will have one more. I, I promise it's the last one. So um, the drop in underlying demand, which which you had displayed earlier. So is that described by drop in productivity, increased energy efficiency, or or, or something else, or just all, all of the above? Um, do you mean underlying demand? or Yes, yes, in terms of the actual demand on, on the grid. So it's actually an increase, a slight increase there, underlying demand. So that's the, the gray area. So if you take the average of that, it averages around 200, um, 200 megawatts increase on average. So 200 megawatts on average, it's you know, starting to get to, it's not in the noise, it's, it's a it's a definite clear signal, but it's still a fairly low increase. But that drop there, is that just like a, a, a time of day drop, yeah. not an overall drop? Yeah, this, this well, yeah, this part here, this yeah. is the evening peak really. So this is, the, this is the peak of demand anyway. So that peak really hasn't changed. It's just throughout, throughout the day, you know, demand is, demand is picked up, which can be explained by weather basically, like cold, a colder May, people having heating sources on longer during the day. So, yeah, like they would have already had it on during the evening. It's a little bit hard to explain, though. It is quite narrow. Like there's just you know, there's no there's no significant uh, like CNI load changes or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is it too early to attribute it to like residential electrification just being southern states? This is a net average, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, too hard hard to tell, yeah. it's too yeah, it's quite a hard one to tell there. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The change, change in, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll forget this. You know. So we'll move on to the, the gas section of the presentation. So I've got four slides here on, on the gas East Coast gas markets. Um, so the chart on the left shows the, there's a few price trends over the last uh, few years. So the purple and the purple is the Brisbane SDM price and the gray, which is, follows that is the Victorian DWGM price. Um, and the, the teal color is the ACCC net back price. So essentially referencing an international price. So in terms of domestic markets, um, you can see that this quarter, the East Coast gas prices were significantly lower than last Q2, same as electricity, although they did, uh, did peak in May again, due to that cold weather and some supply side issues from Longford, which I'll cover in the uh, next slide or two. Um, but then yeah, prices decreased in June when weather reversed, weather became, it became milder, milder temperatures, so not as much heating demand. And then as I've re as we've covered in detail, much less uh, gas-fired generation demand and also an increase in the supply and domestic market, which I'll describe now. So all of those led to a softening of, of gas prices to around $11, $12 a gigajoule in the months of June, significantly less than that, that $40 to $50 a megawatt hour we saw last June. So significant changes. So the chart on the right here shows the changes in gas demand or East Coast gas demand. So starting at the 471 where we were last year, I should just do this in reverse order. So we saw the biggest changes coming down from gas fire generation, which I've which we've explained, we saw that 740 megawatt decrease in gas fired output, which is 16 uh, PJ decrease in, in gas used to generate electricity. Um, and then that's, we also saw a decrease in the C9 residential load here of uh, four, four PJs. So that's, that's residential demand as well as you know, commercial industrial demand. Um, probably about half of that decrease, oops, Half of that decrease is from Queensland's uh, Incitec pivot, Gibson Island. So that's a company that's shut down, shut down their operations in January. So they were previously one of Brisbane's 
uh, like a significant amount of demand in Brisbane, maybe 30% or so of, of gas demand there. And that's so that's that alone has come off around 2.5 PJs. So that's quite a large amount of decrease there in the C9 residential load. Uh, then offsetting those decreases, we saw an increase in the net Queensland LNG supply. So the domestic supply there, I'll cover that a bit more in the next slide. Um, and that's an increase, even though we had, even though GLNG had a train outage during the quarter, which led to an 11.5 PJ decrease, which and their lowest export quarter since Q3 uh, 19. Okay. Um, that's uh, yes. Um, I believe it's domestic demand. Yep. It must be operations at Queensland LNG, not yeah. their domestic consumption. Yeah, because yeah. they do have some yeah. domestic consumption. Yeah. 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 Yeah
um, which contributed to some of the decrease, but it's mostly just due to the decline in gas reserves in the, in the Bass Strait fields connected to Longford. So as I said, um, those fields have been operational since 1969, and it's long been known that those gas fields would run out um, by around the early 2020s. A colleague of mine says he has newspaper clippings from the from that time period that says that it was going to run out around the early 2020s. So not really a surprise that here we are now and it's and it's the field seem to be running down. And then you know, just to put that into context, this is after a decade of relatively high production levels um, driven by export to, LNG export demand. And, and last year we saw that large amount of gas being used in gas fire generation. And just to point out that this is something AMO has been reporting on um, in, the, in terms of the decline of the Victorian gas fields for some time now, and it's included in the gas planning report and the GSU. Um, Would this year's decline be partly as a result of over pumping last year? Um, it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think yeah. even yeah, would, you can see yeah, last year was was quite high. Um, second highest on yeah, record. The second highest. I mean, I haven't looked at the year on years whether 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 a high year or a, a low year always follows a high year. Um, good question, but even then, you can still see the maximum output. The amount that was withdrawn was still less than the maximum output. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, you had one slide where the, the, the LNG in Queensland supplemented Longford. Um, can that trend happen indefinitely? If you had Longford trending down over time, can LNG be f substitutable uh, for for Longford declines? Um, well, I guess it's possible. Makes sense. That's what happened. This this Q two, I think, in terms of long term, I mean, really, the 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 gas that's coming from Queensland to CSG it can't shut off its supply like the way those those um, facilities work is they always have to produce an amount of gas so really what this excess of supply in uh, domestic Queensland here is just caused by lower LNG exports so they're still still exporting LNG but just lower year and year ex exports so a higher supply just another question Sean on that chart on the next one on the next slide yeah, yeah. Um, so what we're saying, what you're saying is that that maximum capacity from the Longford plant is not the plant itself, but more that the supply into the plant from the fields, the combined supply from the multiple Bass Strait fields is, is what's setting that purple bar as opposed to something like the actual plant. Yeah, I'm, like it's I'm not, not actually okay. sure. I'm not actually sure okay. what it is, but the point remains still that it doesn't, right. it hasn't been meeting its maximum. Right. Right. There, there would be more to come out there, but but it didn't. It'd be curious if there was a similar energy crisis this year, because I have noticed those maximums tend to swing around. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that the 2022 one ended up hitting 1,000 TJ a day when needed. Yeah. I'm just curious if it it's could good, again, because yeah. like this, what they quote on the gas bulletin board or what they say yeah. they can do is not necessarily what they actually could do. And I'm just curious. Um, you never know they could actually be able to hit it again if a crisis were to hit if the price was right yeah. is what i'm saying yeah that's a good point yeah. anyway all right well i think we can keep with the discussion around uh time with with victorian gas on this final slide so this is my final slide on on gas and it, here we'll just talk a bit more about the storage so the chart on the left shows um the iona underground storage level so for those unfamiliar the, the Iron Underground Storage is the largest facility in the gas network. It's located in Victoria and it supplies uh, generally, people generally put as much gas in over the uh, summer period uh, in anticipation of winter when that would draw it down. So uh, it has a theoretical maximum of, I think it's around 26 PJs. So the chart here, you can show the, the red line, which is calendar 23. You can see it reached at the beginning of winter or just before winter, it reached near near highest levels. And it was started it followed, started following a trajectory similar to last year. So 22, which is this purple line here. So obviously last year and actually the year before that, we saw a very rapid um, drawdown on our own, uh, underground storage. And this is in part what, what caused uh, the, well, it's not, it is in part, there was multiple parts of the energy crisis last year. So those fears 
that this was going to happen again this year was somewhat allayed by a, uh, a, a milder milder winter and not as much gas fire generation as we as we saw um, so uh, we actually and, and then also combined with that is the increase in Queensland domestic supply meaning there was just more gas available so people didn't need to pull out gas out of iron underground as much so this led to a very strange situation where in June probably for the first time ever we saw refilling of the iron underground um, facility um, although then it started to come back down again in in July I believe it's still around 20 pjs I don't quote me on that but I think it's still around there as of today so still quite full um so again this is really just a result of of what people thought going into winter would look like and then the changes this q2 this winter compared to last year where we didn't see as much uh demand for that gas so then just finally the chart on the right uh keeping with the theme with storage it shows the dandenong lng um contractor status uh, versus tank capacity so a quick recap for those unfamiliar, uh, the Dandenong LNG plant is a, is a 680 or so TJ tank that's purpose is to manage intraday volatility. So unlike owner, owner underground storage, which manages seasonal, uh, seasonal changes, you put it in, put gas in over the, um, over the summer months and draw down over winter, Dandenong LNG is to manage those cold snaps where large amounts of gas is required on the hours to days uh, time frame. So, um, but it does cost to, to put, put gas in, sorry, it does cost to put gas into that tank. And what we've seen historically is um, participants unwilling to, to put, to fill, to put gas, to park gas in that, in that facility, meaning there's a risk there that we may not have enough, as much gas for a um, high demand event. So there was a rule that came in on 15th of December last year that required uh, AMO to essentially buy all of the uncontracted capacity and fill it with gas. So that's what's happened around this period here where the tank capacity went up to full. So um, the capacity there is just total contracted capacity regardless of whether it's AMO or, or another parties. And so this was in response again to expected tight demand and supply um, similar to we saw last year, but. Fortunately, as of yet, we haven't seen that and the tank remains full, fully contracted. Um, yeah, I mean, we seem to be, well, most people th th seem to think we're through the worst of winter here, but then again, the last couple of days were pretty cold. So I don't know how we go. All right, and I believe that's, that's all we've got. Thank you. Um, I might have misheard, but that last storage slide, did you mention that AEMO had contracted that additional storage at Dandenong? Yes, that's correct. So is that effectively AEMO taking part in energy markets directly? That's that's my understanding. That's that's the requirement that the, the rule change that was introduced in December, yes. And is that something that this new state SEC thing is maybe looking at doing in the future to maybe take that role rather than an organisation like AEMO? Um, to ask them, I'm not too sure about that. I don't, that's not my understanding of how it works, but I, I, no, I'm not too sure. Of the capacity that it's fully purchased now, how much of it is by AEMO and how much of it is by commercial? Uh, it's a good question. We don't have that information. And that information is not, not uh, to my understanding, it's not public information, but you can roughly tell there that the tank was already around. 50%, 60% or so contracted. What are we, if we look into the future, what are we most worried about? That's a good, good question. Um, the ESU is full. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said that's what the ESU and the ISP are for. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. That's, I think um, if you ask me, my, my, my thinking around, around what we've seen is this, uh, decreased operational demand during the middle of the day. Um, I haven't shown it here, but uh, there's times when South Australia's got down to 100 megawatts out of 1,000 something or so uh, underlying demand. So that's 10%. Now, I don't like to 
call out states by themselves because they are connected to the rest of the grid, but there's still potential issues there around. And as we saw in, I forget whether it was December or January, where South Australia was islanded. So we did see some issues there. Fortunately, we came through that okay in terms of system security and stability. Um, I'd say that's, a, that's something that AMO as an organisation is looking at very much in a, what does it look like in a world where we have 100% renewables with uh, low inertia. Um, yeah, that's probably, I'd say, my biggest thing, thinking about what, would, what do we need to plan for. Okay, um, just checking if there is any question online. Uh, well, hopefully they can hear me. <laughs> no, no, hopefully they can hear, I think so. Uh, okay, then I think uh, we can just con conclude here. No, th thanks so much, Sean, again. That's like fascinating as always. Okay. So looking forward to the next one. Great, thank, thank you, you Peter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.